Hello to everybody. In five minutes we start. Please have a seat. Please don't be shy. Come on. It's, it, it is a very interactive <laughs> session. Come on, please. Don't be shy. There are a lot of space in front. Please have a seat in five minutes. We start from the back. Hello. Please, don't be shy. There are a lot of space here. Anatoly. Please have a seat. In two minutes, we start the session. Hello to everybody. How are you? I can hear you. Excellent. 
I'm very proud and happy to open this session after the lunch. I'm Federico Semeraro. I come from Italy. I'm a consultant in anesthesia intensive care. I am one of the chair of the session. I'm very happy to inform you that it's a very interactive session. Then, uh, please, from the back, please, please, don't be shy. There is a lot of space here. Uh, it's a pleasure to manage this session with my co-chair. Thank you for your time. Okay, hello. Uh, I, uh, my name is Shin from Seoul Relational University Hospital, Seoul, Korea. It is my great honor for uh, me to be with you for co-moderate. <clears throat> the, remember that this session will be uh, existed for the uh, one and uh, 15 minutes, one hour and 15 minutes. And after the, the 50 minutes, and then we will have an interactive discussion over the left of the 25 minutes. And then remember that after the session, could you uh, check the, your application and then go to the evaluation process and give a big score for the best session. Understand? Okay. I will introduce very, very uh, distinguished speaker for the pediatric emergency. The Ian McConaughey and uh, Monica Kleinman, please come. Ian McConaughey is a consultant in pediatric emergency medicine in Imperial College of NHS uh, Healthcare Trust. He is a uh, very famous man for the research station area, and then he's a currently consultant in pediatric accident emergency medicine in St. Mary Hospital. And he's also the co-chair of the ILCO for pediatrics, and the board member for ERC, and then pediatric group member of the Research and Council of UK. And again, the Monica Kleinman from the Boston uh, Children's Hospital, she is leading the medical surgical ICU and then is the medical director of the Medical Surgical ICU in uh, Children's Hospital in Boston, and served as a medical director for the critical care transportation and then research station program. <clears throat> Remember that they will give a uh, uh, talk together and uh, for the, the same topic. So please welcome. Thanks thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So it's, uh, a hugely overwhelming introduction. I don't recognize either of those no. people on, on stage. I'm sorry about that. Uh, can I have hands up? Who here works in the pre-hospital arena? And who works in the hospital setting? Marvellous. And are there any pediatricians amongst you? That says it all, yes. really. <laughs> it really does. Because pediatrics, who here has a child or children that they, uh, rec uh, is recognized by the state? Who are parents, in other words? Hands up, parents. <laughs> oh, okay. Well done, good. You don't look too tired, so that can't be too bad. Hands up, everyone here who's over the age of 21 and has capacity to give consent. Marvellous, good. You've put your hands up, so you've now agreed to taking part in this interactive session. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through various topics, and we're actually going to stop at the end of a topic for questions to get your experiences and your take. Because who here deals with children on a daily basis in their professional capacity? Marvellous. So the majority of you do. So the aim of the talk that we want to do is to go through some of the common type of conditions um, and to give you some little sort of snippets, but also to get your feedback about sort of things that you've had. We're going to be quite tight on time, I think, but... Um, Hopefully, it should be an enjoyable experience. So I'd like now to ask Monica to take over, if that's OK. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and to work with so many professionals who, uh, who care about children, obviously, uh, which is why you are here. Um, we will just say that as pediatricians, both of us started as pediatricians before going on to further specialties in emergency medicine and in critical care. We are, we are nice, approachable, non-threatening, and no question is stupid because pediatricians are very nurturing people. So you yes. should feel free to ask us anything at all that you want that you ha are wondering about in uh, your practice or your profession in taking care of children. Uh, the whole goal here is to demystify mm -hmm. a bit some of the things that um, people oftentimes hold as being unique or different about children. And yes, there are a couple of things that we'll point out that uniquely affect children, but so much of what you know already 
you can apply to taking care of the injured or, or ill child. Um, so we hope that this will be a, a unique way to look at some of the common pediatric emergencies and also have a chance to uh, ask questions of your own about them. So our goal is to be interactive to the extent possible. Um, we do know not know all your names, so you'll need to help us by raising your hand, and if you don't raise your hand, we will call on you. Uh, and then we will move forward so that we're having an exchange of information as opposed to us just talking at you. Um, one of the things that we can offer because uh, of our advanced maturity is experience. Yes. Um, and experience is one of the greatest teachers. So uh, if, if you have not necessarily experienced something, we hope that we can share it with you in a way that the next time that you see it in the course of your work, it will be interesting. Um, we've divided this into the very logical A, B, C, D, and then somewhere along the way we got to F and N um, to keep us on track. Um, but of course, we'll start with the, with the usual uh, with airway issues. And I should say that the, the blue represents Monica and the green represents me, so that I have got a little bit to say. But as I say, we're going to stop after each one, uh, just as I say, for feedback and comments on. So after Excellent. you, Monica. And the only change in the program is that we uh, are going to uh, postpone septic shock discussion till tomorrow when there is a whole session on serious infections in children and instead today talk about hypovolemic shock, uh, which is certainly one that is the most common for our patient population. So uh, under A, we'd like to talk about some cases of foreign body aspiration. We'd talk, like to talk about the somewhat scary and uh, sometimes perilous situation of fever and strider, most of the time which turns out to not be a major problem, but when it does is certainly something that terrifies even the most experienced of us. Um, and then Ian will talk uh, about croup and some of the things get, that can masquerade as croup along the way. So let's talk, start by talking about foreign body ingestions in children. And one of the principles to start with is to recognize that children become at risk for this once they're able to move around and get to things on their own. So it would be highly unlikely for you to find a four-month-old with a foreign body aspiration. It would be very likely that you might find an 18-month-old who is able to be mobile and walk around and find things and put them in their mouths, which is some developmental milestone which children seem to have. And as we do in pediatrics with everything, we ask you first to think about prevention. The very best thing you can do for a foreign body aspiration is to educate everyone you know about how to avoid this in a pediatric patient by avoiding some of these common uh, airway aspiration items. Uh, of all of these on this table, I can tell that the two most common that I have seen in the lower part of the airway are popcorn and peanuts. Why is a two-year-old? eating a peanut, I don't know. But it does seem to be common that they get a hold of foods that you would typically not recommend for that age group. And the peanuts and popcorn tend to get beyond the upper airway. That's somewhat good news. Whereas some of these other things tend to stay in the upper airway, which can be very difficult. And it's not just solid hard objects. Peanut butter, meatballs, pretzels, anything that can basically be balled up into a huge mouthful of something and then aspirated can serve as a foreign body obstruction. So key to this is understanding that if you're called for a choking episode, just about anything could be down there. And for a child, it may not be as easy as plucking a small piece of something plastic out of the airway. It could be something very complex like this that's resulting in airway obstruction as well as significant aspiration pneumonitis. Now, this is one of my favorite ones. And you're called to the home of a one-year-old who was going through mother's purse and found um, either a penny or a nickel. Not sure which one this is. Where is that? Where is that in the child anatomically? I'll tell you, it's not outside the child. They did not take the x-ray with a coin placed on the chest. Where is that? We have one vote for esophagus. Anyone want to vote for trachea? Well, I can't tell. I truly can't tell from this picture. The only way I could tell is if you turned the child sideways and we looked laterally 
to see whether the coin was toward the back or toward the front, because of course the airway is toward the front, the esophagus is behind it, and we should be able to tell if we look at a lateral film. But what does this child look like clinically? If the, if the coin is in the esophagus, what does the child look like clinically? Okay, Is it a problem to have a coin high in the esophagus? Nothing in comparison to the trachea, thank you. But what happens if you get a very large object into a very small esophagus like this that's located probably within a couple of centimeters of the glottis itself? What's it like for that child to try to swallow? Okay, painful. And where does the, where does the saliva go? It just sits there. It sits there and sits there, and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. So what you'll see with this child is someone who looks like they could very well have an airway problem because they're coughing, choking, sputtering because of the, all the saliva that's building up in the top pouch of the esophagus because it can't get past the coin. So this child may look almost as bad as someone who put the coin in the airway, except they should still be exchanging gas. So they'll look extraordinarily uncomfortable, They'll scare everyone to death, but they're coughing and they're awake. And those are the two things that help you to relax a little bit. So where is this coin? Okay. This coin, the one on the left, is similar to the picture you saw, and that's pretty much right near the airway. That's near the, the glottis, because that baby has a fairly short neck. But as you can clearly see from the picture on the right, it's the posterior column of air. The anterior column air of air is the trachea, the posterior is the esophagus, and fortunately for everyone, that one chose the back pathway. But this child is extremely uncomfortable because the saliva is just going to build up and pour over into the airway or be coughed out. And this child will be sitting up, drooling, tripoding, doing everything they can to try to maintain that airway. But they're likely going to be okay. This is the one we fear the most. Okay? You certainly can get something like a coin to go just the right direction and orientation where it will wind up in the airway. This is not something that uh, this child is going to be awake, alert, and making noises. This child is likely going to be uh, either blue and unconscious or uh, demonstrating signs of severe upper airway obstruction with retractions in an effort to try to move any air past this obstruction. Um, that coin looks like it was basically lodged sideways. The only good news about that is it might be keeping the vocal cords open to the point that some air can get by. But this is the kind of emergency that if our usual basic life support Heimlich maneuvers don't work, is going to require an expert who can put a little piece of forceps in there and grab that coin to pull it out. And that best takes place if the child allows you the time, the child is not blue and bradycardic, that best takes place in the operating room where they can have complete control over the child's level of sedation so they're not bucking and coughing, as well as the ability to do a surgical airway if they need to. If the child's blue and bradycardic and limp, and not fighting, they need you to help. And that's when you're going to go in to look with direct laryngoscopy and try to remove that with a McGill forceps because that child will not be able to wait until they get all the way to the hospital. Okay. Now, in children, of course, we worry about complete obstruction of the upper airway. But a lot of times, they manage to get things down below into the lower part of the airways. Um, and it's really remarkable all the things that we've seen from safety pins to sequins to pieces of food, um, Barbie doll shoes, just about anything can wind up down in the, in the airway. And children who have a foreign body aspiration of the airway may present with something that looks a lot like asthma, looks a lot like wheezing. And that's because they truly are having air trapping, but it's typically in a larger airway with the foreign body. And one way that you can make that distinction is if you look at an x-ray of a child who's ingested or inhaled a foreign body to determine if there's differential inflation, if one side looks more inflated than the other. Because the side that uh, is more inflated has air trapped behind that object, which is acting like a ball valve. Okay. 
In this particular case, what does, which, which lung has the foreign body in it? Okay, hands up for right. Hands up for right. And hands up for left. Hands up for left. And hands up, I, I don't know, I just want to carry on okay. having a nice quiet yes. time. Yes, so indeed the right side, so there's an object in the airway on the right side that is basically causing a ball valve effect and resulting in air can come in when one actively inhales but can't escape back out when one passively exhales. And this child may have very significant wheezing, uh, and you can see here, this is at the carina, and this whatever it is, whether it's a little ball bearing or a pearl, I don't know, um, is sitting right there in the right main stem bronchus. Interestingly, although they say it's a straighter shot to go down the right main stem, I can personally tell you that the majority of foreign bodies that I've been involved with wind up in the left side, and I don't know why. But it, it is not at all uncommon to have them go down the left as well. Monica, do you think you can sometimes pick up the hyperinflated aspect on one side because there isn't as much movement? It can be difficult, can't it? It but can be difficult, but if that side is truly hyperinflated, it's harder to get more air in there to yeah. make it move. Yeah. So yes, it can, it can look asymmetric even from the outside, but the breath sounds should be clearly abnormal on the side with the ball valve, and you might hear just a very tight wheeze mm -hmm. unilaterally. One thing I do want to caution you about is disc batteries, okay? All of you who are parents and raised your hands, I want you to go home and lock up your disc batteries tighter than you lock up your medications, tighter than you lock up your cleaning supplies, because these can not only serve as a source of choking and obstruction, but they are very destructive when they interact with the mucosa of the airway. And this is just a demonstration. This is a disc battery that's been put on some lunch meat because they can't really show you an esophagus, but this, this basically starts dissolving and corroding and has acid inside, which will literally eat through the esophagus and result in a perforation. And so if a child may have aspirated or swallowed a disc battery, that's not something that can wait till the morning even if the child looks asymptomatic. Mother says, oh, I'll just keep watching the stool until that comes out. No, if it's a disc battery, got to get it out right away because this can start happening within hours of the time that the child ingests it. So be very cautious with that particular type. Okay. So questions about experiences of foreign bodies. Have any of you been involved in children who've had obstructive airways from inhalation of a foreign body. Okay. Yep, sir, do you want to? Yep. Grapes, yeah. And we were just discussing the PICU. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite sad, actually. The grapes, sausages, as you showed, bits of bacon, and lots of things. And it seems like a really dumb way to get asphyxiated. Can I just ask a question? Of course. Slightly foreign bodies, but a bit high up. I see a lot of children with peanuts, beads, and things in their noses um, yes. well the ones that we can't get out in our uh, department we bring back to the ED cl um, clinic or the ENT clinic in the morning but the question I always get asked by the parents is a, how likely is it to go backwards and cause a true sort of aspiration problem so I just wondered in your experience how often that is and do you give them any particular advice mm -hmm. for either avoiding that or no, um, no. So firstly, the finger is a very dangerous object in a child. It causes nosebleeds and sticks fingers up there. And when you ask them why, a bit like when Edmund Hillary was asked, why did you go to the top of Everest? He, they replied, because it's there. So they like sticking things in different places. The ear is safer than the nose. You try and do the kiss. So you try and get the parent, as it were, to do the kiss, which is essentially to suck it out, and that does most things. It depends what it is. If it's something that's not going to be moving very much, then usually you can wait till the ENT. Otherwise, get the ENT to come, and, under, and this is where you have to have careful with sedation and make sure you don't fiddle around too much with the children, direct removal. But that's what we'd advise in the ED. Yeah. The, the passage is widest here and narrows as you go in. Yeah. So chances are pretty good if it got stuck on the way in, yeah. it can't go back any further. Yeah. Um, that being said, if the, if the parent sees that the child is coughing or appears to be having trouble breathing, that would be a reason to, to return. But in general, it usually gets stuck in there, which is why we can't get it back out. Okay. Yeah, super. 
Thank you. Right, let's move on. Time presses. Okay. So upper airway infections are very common in children, and the combination of fe fever and strider is something uh, for me which is very common, but also it can make me very worried because there are airway infections that can act like foreign bodies in the sense that without expert management, they can lead to total obstruction and result in a life-threatening problem. But 99 times out of 100, it's something much more simple. How do you tell the difference between the child who has the problem that's going to be acutely life-threatening and the child who uh, basically needs uh, some amoxicillin and will get better in a few days? So fever and strider always makes us stop and think and think of what the worst thing is it could be. And in your mind, what's the worst thing it could be if it was fever and strider? What's the worst thing it could be? Chances are good you haven't seen it before. What are you told? Epiglottitis is what we're told to be afraid of. How many people have seen epiglottitis? All right, so a smattering, good. Some in the ICU. In the field, people who've seen epiglottitis? Okay, just a couple. All right, good. I've been doing critical care for 20 years, and I've seen real epiglottis perhaps five times. Okay, and part of that is because of vaccinations, which are now available. When I was a resident and in pediatrics, it was before the Haemophilus influenza vaccine, and we used to see epiglottitis about, oh, I don't know, every couple of months, and it was a very common thing. But real epiglottitis is fortunately very rare in developed countries where there are vaccination programs, but it's still what you think about in the back of your head, which is how do I know this child with fever and strider doesn't have epiglottitis? Well, what are some of the clues that the obstruction is so severe that it could represent the, basically the opening to the airway? Okay. What are some of the clues that you might get that this is not just someone with fever and a little bit of a hoarse cough and a little noisy breathing. Okay. All right, for those of you who saw the epiglottitis, now I get to come back to you. What did it look like? There were two people who raised their hand and said they saw epiglottitis in the field. What did it look like? Oh, I have to pay more attention so I can call on you again. <laughs> They can't swallow. Okay, number one, it is so painful. They do not want to swallow, okay? So like your person who has the coin, they are just drooling out of the airway. They do not want to swallow. So they just let the mouth hang open and let those secretions come out. What else? Do they, do they talk? No. It's so painful they don't want to talk, okay? What sick, scared child doesn't want to tell you to go away? These ones tell you... Uh, will not tell you to go away because th it is so painful that all they want to do is just not move. If they do manage to talk a little bit first, I have a very hot potato voice, and they don't want to really form words in a way that you're going to be able to easily understand them. So fortunately, not everything is that. Um, the reason epiglottitis is obviously a big deal is it's right there at the top of the airway and can truly cause acute, severe, life-threatening obstruction. Um, more commonly is you're going to have something involving the, the trachea, which is viral in nature, although you can get a bacterial super infection on that, as Ian will talk about, or lower airway or bronchiolitis, which we will get to. But that epiglottitis is at a really key place. This is someone with what's called a peritonsillar abscess. Um, you're looking into the mouth, and it, the uvula, which should be right in the midline, you can see is pushed way over to one side, and that's because there's a large abscess involving the area around the tonsil, and the tonsil is that little bit of tissue that's just peeking out next to the uvula. Um, this is something which can be very painful, uh, can make the kid feel really awful, but they're breathing okay. okay? And really, that's what we care about when we talk about life-threatening problems. This is the distinction you want to be able to make, which is the epiglottis sits at the doorway to the airway. And that's the one where if that's inflamed, you're going to wind up with someone who can have complete obstruction. And that complete obstruction is not something that you want to have to address in the field in particular. So on the left is a normal airway of a child with that nice U-shaped epiglottis. 
uh, the false vocal cords and vocal cords, but everything is nice and you know, shiny and healthy looking, as opposed to on the right, where the old word for epiglottitis, and perhaps not so old, used to be superglottitis, and it was superglottitis because it's above the glottis, and you can see it's just this massive swollen piece of tissue that literally the edges of it are starting to kiss to obstruct the airway. And so that's where you want to be in a place where there are additional resources for securing that airway. Again, if the child's blue and bradycardic, you have no choice but to try to intervene. But until then, this is the child you want to keep sitting in a position of comfort. Don't make them mad. Don't start an IV. Don't separate them from the parents. Let them just focus on drooling and continuing to breathe. Because if you put in your laryngoscope and see that, it's likely to yeah. be an extremely challenging airway. Yeah. Thank you. And just, and just to add to a story, in 1992, I was the registrar in Lewisham Hospital, busy district general hospital. A child came in, three-year-old, tripoding, hands on here, drooling, hot, toxic, irritable, didn't want to say anything. So um, what I did was, smiling, I put on my, what I call my uh, fixed uh, dilated smile. <laughs> <laughs> There's not really a smile here, it's just the facade it's of a teeth smile. Gritting. It's teeth grinning, my yeah. teeth are out. And picked up the phone and smiling got my uh, consultant ENT, my consultant paediatrician, my consultant anaesthetist, and smiling, we all went up to the recovery room with the child and with the mother, and they thanked me profusely for helping them make a diagnosis of acute tonsillitis. But that's fine, because it was safe, and that's the whole point. If you're worried, get help and smile, because smiling is a really good thing to do to children. But moving on to another thing where you often don't see so much in the smiles, croup. Now, croup is sort of a, a winter event, isn't it, really? In summer, in the UK, we have a cuckoo, and in the winter, we have the snot of bronchiolitis and the dull barking seal of croup. Hands up all those who recognise croup. Hands up. OK. Now, um, lovely people in that row there, can you uniformly give the cough of a croup, please? Yeah. Yes, all three together. Come on, listen. Uh, uh, uh. So some dead. people say it's like a seal. Yes, some people say it's like a dog. Uh, uh. And, it's, sort of, and it's, an, it's a sound that you can hear, and you know that it's upper airway. Upper airway. Is it a worry? Isn't it a worry? What's croup due to? What's it caused by? What sounds like the word not and begins with S? <laughs> Snot. It's a viral-induced problem, and usually it's going to go away by itself. Usually it's not a problem, and there's narrowing here in, in the windpipe, and that's really where the problem is. There otherwise, they may have had an antecedent or often, at the same time, they've got a runny nose, they're generally a bit unwell, they feel hot, they feel a bit they don't feel toxic as such. Toxic being a phrase describing flat out and not wanting to respond. They'll still drink, but they'll be a bit miserable, a bit poorly, as we might say. She's a bit poorly today. But they're not absolutely unwell, as you see with the next condition, which is a tracheitis. Now, this is where you get secondary bacterial infection. And can you see that? That, that's got a really nasty appearance. From before, you saw it was nice and sort of pink. There's sort of variation in colour, and sometimes you can see pus. And again, when I was doing PICU, tubing some of these children, you would actually get pus, or having a look, you could see there was pus uh, around the margins or coming up. Very inflamed and swollen. You may get biphasic stridor, um, and they, they generally are quite unwell. And often there's a toxin-mediated process and these are the worried children. So croups don't tend to be, these are generalizations, don't tend to be as severely ill as these children. So these are a bit like sort of the epiglottitis, but a bit lower down. But they don't necessarily drool, but they're hot and toxic, and they may have a stridor. Fortunately, they're not that common, relatively speaking, to croup. Most of croup gets better by itself. Um, sometimes uh, croups do go into trouble, but that's at the top of the pyramid. And often enough, a bit of dexamethasone, for example, orally, or if you have the money, 
budesonide nebulizers, because they're much more expensive, often will do the trick, and they just act by reducing the amount of vascularity there is, and you can sometimes almost see an improvement within 20 or 30 minutes from oral ingestion. There are about eight different regimes, and there's a Cochrane database about how much you should use. Use what is effective. And you have to tell the parents that, yes, you are giving them steroids, but no, they're not going to turn into nightclub bouncers who are going to become psychotic. Uh, because you can give it for about three days or so. And a lot of parents do ask a question, will it stunt his growth? Or will she become a bodybuilder? And these sort of questions, because of steroids, have bad connotations to them. If they're really tight, uh, then you may need to think about giving an adrenaline nebulizer, which is just a holding pattern, uh, to getting help from our critical care experts. And they may think about intubating, depending. As I said, when I did PICU, there was a three-year-old who uh, took a 2.5 tube, which is what you'd need for a neonate. Mm -hmm. But that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, but that's the pinnacle, as it were, of the vast majority of groups who are normal. Mm -hmm. Bacterial tracheitis is a different scenario. They're unwell, and they need uh, PICU attention, without a doubt. Um, Let's move on. Any experiences, again, in terms of bad croup or the more sinister bacterial tracheitis? Have any of you had a chance to see them? Have any of you seen croup? Yes, any parents here? We saw here? a lot of croup. Any, we saw there were parents here. So you're all lying. Your parents are lying because their children have had croup at some time. It's almost like a rite of passage, and you stay up all night, and you hear them hacking away, and as long as they're drinking, then usually they're okay, and they just need symptomatic pain relief. But that's usually the sort of scenario. We say, okay, so that concludes talking mm -hmm. about croup. Let's move on then. So we're not going to talk about asthma because you all know about asthma. We're going to talk about anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is uh, another one of these very dramatic events that can have a, a terrifying uh, onset that uh, really terrifies both the patient and the care provider. Uh, how many people have seen a true case of anaphylaxis? I don't just mean hives and you're a little bit itchy. I mean the face swells up, the lips swell up, the tongue is protruding. Okay, all right. What did the anaphylax do? After IV analgesics, okay? So a drug. Okay. Oh, in asystole. That's, that's bad. Um, so, yes, it can be to a drug for certain. Yeah. A bee. A bee. Okay, yes, nasty little creatures. And, yes, someone who's helplessly out in the open and is stung by a bee. Uh, hopefully they're aware that they have this and are prepared by carrying their own adrenaline, but we all know that isn't always going to happen. Who else? Who else seems true anaphylaxis? I see a hand. Yeah. What was it to? Nuts. Nuts. Okay, great. So foods, drugs, and the environment are probably the big ones that are going to be an issue. And one of the things we know with children is that as they grow and then get exposed to something, they may have their first encounter with an allergen. That means that they get sensitized to it. They may not do so badly with that. It may make them feel sick to their stomach or, or give them some diarrhea. But the next time they see it, their immune system is primed to have this massive overreaction to something it considers an, an evil spirit whether it's peanut butter or it's penicillin or uh, it's a bee sting. So, in fact, some of your worst anaphylaxis patients who are young may never have had a history of being allergic to that particular thing because the first time they saw it, they just had a very mild reaction, and now they have the, the real thing. What's the big danger for someone like this with anaphylaxis? What are you most worried about? Airway obstruction. Okay. The edema is profound, and it's fast, to the point that the tongue might be protruding out of the airway. The only good thing about that is that if it's moving forward, it may 
be less likely to obstruct posteriorly if it's just the anterior part of the tongue that is swollen. But in severe anaphylaxis, this can take place all the way down the airway and into the tracheobronchial tree, in which case you're dealing with an extremely narrow passage with high resistance. And the longer you wait, the less time you have, although treatment, early and aggressive treatment, might help turn that around. What else are you worried about with this youngster? Airways first, for sure. Say again? Blood pressure. Blood pressure. Okay, so airway breathing we'll put together so he could have bronchospasm as well. But then in cases of profound anaphylactic shock, you can have essentially uh, stunning of all of the blood vessels to the point that they vasodilate and that patient has cardiovascular collapse. Uh, it's extremely impressive if you've seen it and responds only to direct treatment with catecholamines like epinephrine. But the first thing you're going to be worried about, of course, is what you can see visually here, which is what's happening to the upper airway. Next thing, what's happening to the lower airways, and then the circulatory system. There are patients who will have just the cardiac collapse with anaphylaxis. Fortunately, that's rare, and it can be very tricky because you're not sure what caused it. And those are patients who typically have some reaction in hospitals, such as a latex allergy, uh, or get an intravenous injection of something to which they profoundly react. Okay. At least in the United States, um, this has become a common phenomenon, peanut-free zones, where uh, children in particular are taught to not bring peanut butter to school. If they do, they have to be isolated and punished over at the peanut table, and everybody else gets to be at the peanut-free table. Uh, it's a, it's a little bit uh, interesting, but because we know these reactions can be so severe, um, the, the schools have gone to great lengths to try to protect children from uh, tree nuts, which are one of the most serious allergens and responsible for some of the fatal reactions that are seen. And can I just say, how many people here have had peanuts on an airline recently? I bet you haven't. Because, again, the dispersal, as soon as people better. open up the packets, it goes through the AC. So if you go on such an airline, please carry your own EpiPen for others around you. Okay, <laughs> so check out with the airline, do you give peanuts or not? Go on the ones that doesn't give peanuts because then you have a nice, calm trip. Lovely idea. Now, I'm going to make this point about anaphylaxis. And uh, you know that in pediatrics, we preach and we preach airway, airway, airway. We do yoga and we say airway, airway, airway all day long. The problem with anaphylaxis is it's not going to stop until they get the epinephrine. And so one of, the, one of the things, if you suspect anaphylaxis and you see those lips swelling up and you see that face turning into one big hive, is even though you were told, airway, by everybody, take the time to hit them with the epinephrine because it will take anywhere from a minute or two for that to get absorbed into the system and to start combating the reaction. If you wait a minute or two, they're likely to be getting hypotensive, their circulation is impaired so they won't be able to absorb the epinephrine and get it to go around the system and get to the target. This is one of those times where something trumps. You're doing it for the airway, but you're not directly managing the airway. You're trying to get the epinephrine into them. And so it is one of those unusual circumstances where first therapy is going to be to try to get the epinephrine into them. Then you may go back to addressing the airway, which is only going to get better now that you've given the epi. The auto-injectors, uh, I think, have um, been very helpful in many systems because they've reduced the incidence of error from drawing up epinephrine by hand. But if you do drop epinephrine by hand, uh, just remember the importance of accuracy with this particular drug because, yes, too little could be harmful because it's not going to treat the problem, but too much could be extremely harmful if, for instance, you gave this concentration of epinephrine through an intravenous line, which is hard to do when it's an auto-injector. How many people have actually had to deliver uh, epinephrine in the field for an allergic reaction? Okay, yeah. Okay, how many have used the EpiPen? Is that uh, a product that is available in your system? One, yeah, okay. What happens when you take the EpiPen out of the box and 
you're standing there holding it. What do you have to do to make it work? Say again? Honest answer, I don't remember. Okay. So take off the blue cap. Excellent. So I can't tell you the number of people I've seen who've never given an EpiPen and are put in that situation. <laughs> and they stand and they look at it, and then they, they know they're supposed to do that, and nothing happens. So you have to take the blue cap off the end so that it will deliver its spring loaded. So it's a good idea if you work in the field you do, unpack your EpiPen every now and then and take a look at it. Because even the EpiPen trainers don't have that blue cap on them. It's gray and it can be very deceiving. Uh, and it's a really helpless feeling to be standing there not being able to deliver your epinephrine mm -hmm. for someone who's anaphylaxing. But be careful you don't accidentally test yourself. Some yep. people do do. Yes. And therefore have adrenaline fingers as well. It's a there's bad a, idea. There's a, a story again about a five-year-old local school known to have peanut anaphylaxis. was hypertensive, stridor. This is the phone call that we got. We're coming in. When, we came, when the child got to us, which was about 15 minutes later with a paramedic crew, they give them the EpiPen, they had a line in, they give chlorophenamine, and um, they check the BM. And the kid was fine. And I didn't have to do anything, which was fabulous. Although, admit him, because you can get rebound because the allergen is still in the stomach. But that, they, that crew just did the, most, the greatest job, and he was absolutely fine, and he knew he was going to be absolutely fine. So doing it there and then was life-saving. Really absolutely. impressive. These other things that you're going to secondarily do, um, like administer oxygen, perhaps some bronchodilators, uh, steroids will take a little while to work, antihistamines. It's the epi first that's going to be life saving. Yeah. So, thank you. So, moving on now to acute bronchiolitis, really, really common problem associated largely with, uh, uh, with viral infections, respiratory syncytial virus, and much, as I said, much as uh, swifts migrate to go back to South Africa, then the virus migrates in to inhabit the nostrils and other secretions of young children, particularly under the age of six months. And uh, the reason why they're so prone is, one, because they may have older siblings who like to share and care for them, disseminating goodness, including viral infections acquired at nursery or other community centers. And secondly, because of the, as you remember, the differences that there are in very young children. I'll come on to those. But the part of the airway that's affected is at the very bottom, as it were, of the branches, the respiratory uh, part of the airway. Now, uh, can you just imagine yourself, um, well, we'll come on to this in, in a minute, there is change in terms of size of the airways over uh, time. And so these are the diameters of uh, the trachea, the bronchioles, the terminal bronchioles, and the alveoli. And you can see that the size greatly increases in terms of their dimensions, right the way along, and including the alveoli. And when you start off in life, you're, if you were to do this, and someone has done this, I don't know why, but they have, measuring the square surface area of the lungs. And if you spread a young neonate out, it's almost about three square meters. Are there any tennis players here? Do any of you play tennis? Then, of course, there's someone who plays tennis. You've all played tennis badly. Um, I've played tennis badly, very badly. But when you play on a tennis court, that's 70 square meters, which is what your lungs are in terms of spread out. So it's a huge expanse. Increase in the number of value, increase in the size, and increase in the dimensions. And the importance of that uh, is key when you think about obstruction of the airway due to these secretions. So the virus causes a hypersecretion throughout as well the respiratory tree. Now, I want to take you to Irma or to Sainsbury's or to any supermarket, and I want you to stand at the groceries, and I want you to take up two heads of broccoli, OK? So upside down, so you're holding them by the stalk. That, if you think, is your uh, respiratory part at the very bottom. And the little florets, you know, the little things at the end, those are your alveoli. Now, they're completely independent. So if you have a lot of secretion, you block off the top of that particular stalk. And so you've taken out that whole broccoli head with snot. You can't do any gas exchange there at all because it's just occluded by the secretions. So what do you do? You try and breathe harder. You elevate the amount of peep that there is. You grunt. And the next door broccoli head expands in size to try and make up. So you've got one head of broccoli that's doing no gas exchange 
and the one next door now that's under pressure because it's really hyperinflating. And because it's hyperinflating, it's squeezing out the blood that goes through it. So it's decreasing how much blood you actually get through it. So again, although you've got gas going in, the amount of diffusion, relatively speaking, into the capillaries is limited because there's not as much flow. And so you've got this mismatch completely. And that's one of the reasons why children, very young children are so susceptible. The ribs are very horizontal, they're pretty poor, they're not ossified in under six months old, and they don't have much scope of moving. And if you're breathing fast, your diaphragm is going to be pushed up because you swallow a lot of air. So you get almost like a football underneath the diaphragm, and it's difficult to compress a really pumped up football. The other thing is you are an obligate nasal breather, so you have to breathe through your nose. And of course, these secretions mean that you've got 50% of your upper airway obstructed by snot. Now, most children are fine, and most children don't run into problems. But as you know, the natural history is usually they are worse by about day three to day five, and things like how much are they taking in will be important. So there's guidance that if they decrease their intake by 50% or lower, then they're in trouble. And that reflects that of the two, you'd rather breathe than eat, because you need to breathe first, and then you can eat. But if you're so tachycneic, if you're breathing so fast that it's difficult for you to eat, then you're in trouble. And so those are the sort of things that you need to look for. And knowing the natural history will be really important. So, and in terms of treatments, there are really no effective treatments at all. This is the British Thoracic Guidance. And sometimes you can get paradoxical bronchoconstriction after nebulizers. There's the Cochrane Review, again, which has looked at all bronchodilators in bronchiolitis. Nothing helps. What does help is trying to... Uh, help where secretions if they need sucking out for example and only a small number need admission anyway and avoidance too but sometimes children who aren't feeding well they may benefit from an NG tube so they don't have to work hard in terms of feeding thereafter you may go down the IV route but it's mostly supportive and most children sort themselves out it's only very few who come to you isn't it for ECMO really I, I, I'd guess not, usually not ECMO, maybe one or two a year for ECMO, but uh, yeah. the, the ones who uh, get the severe pneumonitis will sometimes wind up on a ventilator for a week or 10 days. Yeah, yeah. But again, not wanting to because there's this differential. And ventilating bronchiolitis can be really hard, as I say, because there's an inflated area in one part and a completely obstructed area mm -hmm. in another. Bit of a nightmare. Okay. Shock. Now, again, we're going to be covering some of shock, aren't we, as well? Yes. Septic shock tomorrow. But what is shock to you? What does shock mean to you? Why do we worry about shock? Cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest, absolutely, yes. If you don't do anything about it, you die. And generally, that's not a good thing unless you're expected to die, in which case it's planned. Yes, so shock. Shock is quite difficult to pick up in children because often they hang on physiologically and then drop off the edge. Okay, they really do. Um, and again, I think this is something that we will be covering tomorrow, but just to remind you about hypovolemic shock. You get hypovolemic shock from trauma, but you also get hypovolemic shock, for example, in a distributed fashion as in anaphylaxis because you've got little circulating fluid, relatively speaking, because it's gone into the wrong spaces. Now, have any of you seen severe meningococcal disease? Hands up, yeah? Okay, hands up. Or, or third spacing due to infections. Have any of you seen dengue fever? I'm looking mm. at my uh, Southeast Asian colleagues. Dengue fever? Nope. Uh, endemic in parts of India, uh, Vietnam, for example. Again, where you get leak, capillary leak, and third spacing. And it's fluid being in the wrong compartment. The commonest cause we see, of course, is due to trauma. Now, who had a cup of coffee here this morning? Marvellous, yes. And you had one of those beakers, yes? How much was in one of those beakers, do you think? How many mils? Mm. Why don't you choose a number between 249 and 251? <laughs> okay, choose a number. Yeah, 250, okay. So, a neonate who is born, a beautiful little neonate coming out, say weighing uh, three kilos, yes? Little light, three kilos. What's the circulating volume for that little baby, given that it's 80 mils per kilo? So I'm asking you to three times eight. 
240 mils, I hear you say. Fantastic. So the circulating volume of that cup of coffee that you had is slightly more than a three kilo baby. So, I mean, I'm not asking you to drink 240 mils of coffee, but just to give a sense of how much volume they have in the first place. So in other words, you can get relatively... Um, you, there isn't much volume to lose in the first place in children. That's why there are millions of children who die around the world from diarrhea and vomiting, because, again, they lose fluid. And replacing that fluid can be quite difficult. And the mechanisms are illustrated here as to what happens decreased return of volume to the blood, decreases the output, goes to hypertension, poor perfusion, organ dysphagia, multi-organ failure. And as you know from people who, I'm sure you've all done life support courses, there's a stage where this becomes irreversible and no matter what you do, you're on a loser. And you do see that. We do see that. We had a young 14-year-old who stabbed uh, multiple times who retroperitoneal bled but maintained his physiology to a very late stage and essentially he bled out into the retroperitoneal space and died. But it was so difficult to see the physiology because he kept going, kept going until he crashed. Um, and he was in irreversible shock. And it's always something that you're going to be careful about when you look at vital signs, the whole picture. Thinking about children don't have that same duration, as it were, of physiological adaption, they go quite quickly. And as you know, this has been one of the, the blessings to us, certainly. Who here carries one of these sort of devices on their pre-hospital ambulance? Yeah, they're fantastic. Yep. Excellent. They really are. Who here has used it on a conscious, awake child? Yeah, and you have to ideally infiltrate with lignocaine down to the periosteum because it hurts. And you also have to explain to parents why uh, you're putting a nail into their leg, because that looks weird, doesn't it? From the parents' point of view, uh, it used to be better even with a cook's caster, because then it looked like you were putting a doorknob into a child's leg or arm. But you have to explain what you're doing, but it's one of the most effective ways of getting fluid into someone. Devised, the principle was devised in the 1930s, so it goes back quite a while. So volume resuscitation, and again, we'll come to talk about that um, uh, uh, a bit later on. Okay, now on to status. All right. So other than uh, respiratory problems, seizures are probably one of the most common reasons that pre-hospital care providers are called to take care of a child. Um, and it, it's not because they are the most dangerous things in the world, but they're intensely dramatic. And any parent who sees a child sees knows that that's a terrifying experience. Uh, and um, perhaps in a good way, almost always means that EMS has the opportunity to be involved and provide some pre-hospital care, as opposed to the little one with shock or respiratory distress who just gets scooped up and put in the back of the car and driven to the emergency department. Um, but status epilepticus has um, uh, some really interesting things about it, and I want to emphasize a couple of principles that I think are useful for the pre-hospital environment. First of all, what is it? And status is a, a term that we use uh, somewhat casually. Um, the people who care about this and study it are more precise in terms of the actual number of minutes or perhaps the total amount of time someone doesn't regain consciousness. But for our purposes, Status epilepticus is a seizure that goes on despite our treatment. And the purist will say that status epilepticus is defined as seizures as being more than 30 minutes of continuous seizure activity or someone who seizes, stops, seizes, stops, but never wakes up in between is true status. However, I will tell you that 30 minutes is an awfully long time before you might say, I now declare we have status epilepticus and therefore we are going to treat these seizures that most experts would recommend that you start treating after about five minutes of continuous seizure. Because by the time it hits 30 minutes, it's extremely difficult to break. The longer it goes on, the longer it takes to break the status epilepticus. And that's why pre-hospital care is oftentimes uh, the, the group that is in a position to do something about this. Remember, the 30-minute definition is a time but that's also when neuronal damage may start to happen because ongoing electrical activity that's supercharged in the brain can start to deprive neurons of their 
oxygen and nutrient supply and literally lead to brain damage. That doesn't mean that the child who has a 31-minute seizure is going to be brain damaged. What it does mean is that there are subtle things that happen if you have a seizure disorder every time you have status epilepticus, and you don't want that to be additive for a patient who's at risk of that disease again and again. We talk about partial versus generalized seizures as really just describing whether something is localized to one area of the brain or if it is in the, affecting the entire brain and spreading. And that's the EEG people's terms for it. For us, what that translates into with a generalized seizure is that someone is both unconscious and probably making some abnormal movements, although they don't have to be. Uh, in a generalized seizure, we associate them most typically with the tonic-clonic movements. Whereas the partial ones, someone may or may not be unconscious, but they typically have only one part of the body affected or uh, have just one type of phenomenon going with the seizure, like a loss of consciousness and limpness. Partial seizures can generalize, which is how you can have someone start with shaking of an arm or leg that then goes to involve the entire body. And here's a couple of examples. So this is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. This child's not awake. You could shout her name, and she would not hear you, even though she has her eyes open. The cognitive areas of her brain are all involved in this seizure activity. And you can see that she's got the shaking and stiffening of extremities. Stiffening is the tonic. Shaking is the clonic. What else do you see there? What's going on with her? her airway. Okay. It's not hard, it's hard to see colors, hard to tell if she's had any color change. Um, but you could see from the secretions, she's not swallowing normally, and so she's not clearing her airway. You may disregard this woman. Um, and that's one of the things that is challenging in a prolonged seizure, is that someone can develop obstruction of the upper airway just from secretions that they're not swallowing. Or if they were eating right before it happened and they vomit, they could potentially have vomitus in the airway. This is what's called an absence seizure. It's also generalized because it makes you unconscious. But it's not associated with any motor activity. So here's this little guy just going along, minding his own business, writing in his book, doing his homework, when all of a sudden, his eyes flutter, he stares, he's not awake, and almost as quickly as it started, oh, here we go, we're back to doing, what was that problem again? And this is obviously a, a, a less dramatic type of seizure than the generalized tonic-clonic, but you can imagine, for safety reasons, if this child was crossing the street, riding his bike, driving a car, which would be a problem anyway, uh, that could be a very dangerous type of seizure to have. And some patients will become limp and have what are called drop attacks with absence seizures. Okay. This is a complex partial seizure, and what that means is that partial involves only one part of the brain, so you're not going to have the overall shaking. Okay. And it's complex because he's also got... Uh, unconsciousness. He's not really awake there. His eyes are open, but he's not really awake. Dad's trying to get him to come out of it. It's turning a little bit blue around the edges because he's not breathing normally. He obviously has some sort of chronic neurologic problem because the right side of his head is shaved, I'm guessing, for a shunt. And mm. he's NG fed, probably because he doesn't swallow very much. Okay. And pretty soon he starts to kind of look around a little bit, focus a little bit better, and come out of it. Those can be a lot more difficult to recognize. And here's a partial seizure that generalizes. So this kid's seizures cause him to cry out and open his mouth and it sort of arches back. So it's an, a, a different seizure phenomenon that we saw, but it's clearly very focal. But as time goes on, that focal seizure source can sending out bad signals can get into other parts of the brain and result in a partial seizure that will generalize. And when that happens, he's not going to be breathing or swallowing as well, and all of a sudden this becomes a more dangerous situation. Uh, see those eyes looking straight up? That's the sign that the seizure is going on and on and on. It's not stopping in between. And I promise you it does go on to generalize. 
uh, if we were to give it a little more time, but we won't. But remember, the longer the seizure persists, the harder it is to break. So this is the reason why by the time you're called, surely it's been about five minutes or more since the seizure started. So try to get a good history. How long has the child been seizing? Because that's, your time zero is not when you arrive at your house. Your time zero is when the child started seizing. And you want to take that time into account. And be prepared to uh, aggressively support that child with suctioning and maintenance of the airway and to obtain access. It's a great circumstance. If what we're trying to do is stop the seizure hmm. and prevent the child from progressing to arrest. It's a great time for the use of an IO. They're probably not conscious, and you don't want to wait until you're doing CPR to start that IO. You want to use it to get control of the situation. So remember, their airway is often compromised. They oftentimes aren't breathing well. They may be tachycardic and hypertensive while they're seizing. That's a normal sympathetic response. Um, and temperature control is, temperature is often what triggers this in children, even if they have an underlying seizure disorder, an, an intercurrent illness can be the problem. Another thing I want to emphasize, the best way to improve the airway of a seizing child, I love doing that, the best way to improve the airway of a seizing child is to stop the seizure. It's very difficult to do mask ventilations on a seizing patient. It's very difficult to even get the jaw open on a seizing patient. The best way to get control of that airway is to stop the seizure. That's why we start at five minutes instead of waiting for 30 minutes, which point someone might have had hypoxic injury. So a few pearls. Avoid, uh, avoid trying to actively do anything such as putting something between the teeth uh, or trying to forcibly restrain the patient. It won't work. Um, you'll just wind up injuring the child who's seizing if you try to restrain their extremities. Don't even try, just clear things away. Make it a safe place for them to have a seizure and then treat the seizure. How, how many people, how many services here have used buccal midazolam or PR diazepam or diazomols? Yep, Scotland, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, and those are really good ways and often enough if these are children who've got chronic fitting then there may well be uh, um, buccal midazolam in the fridge and sometimes parents will give either oral or rectal um, which is very very appropriate but just keep an eye on the respiratory depression because sometimes we have children who come in who've had five even ten milligrams of diazepam and they've stopped seizing but they've also stopped breathing that doesn't matter because you can just put an NG tube down and just bag them up and it's quite soothing and if you've got a bit of music you can just be quite calm and just bag away and life is going on and it's all fine but it's really important to just keep an air on the airway, airway in that situation. Okay. We're probably going to need to, We're gonna uh, need to allow move on, for aren't some we? Yes. questions. Yes. Um, we, we could uh, so we'll cut, we'll do this tomorrow um, in our discussion. No, we'll, f we'll finish with this. So okay. this is just to say about the fluids. Now, there's a lot of contention about IV fluids and so on, and this is just some work that was done in ILCOR, and these are the people, I won't, but you can see that they're from all over the world, and the question was about septic shock. Does restrictive volumes less than 20 mils per kilo compared to non-restrictive or the use of non-crystalloid compared to crystalloid alter any of these outcomes? So what are we doing with our fluid management, essentially, was the question. And there was a big surprise as there was a study called FEAST. I don't know if you've heard of FEAST. It's a randomized control trial that took place in Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. And there were three groups. There was a group who had bolus, of uh, the, um, the uh, uh, colloid, bolus of normal saline, and then no bolus, so control group. And that control group was put in at the request of the ethical uh, agency, not the investigators, which is quite interesting. And the primary hour point was, what was their mortality like two days afterwards? And this was the surprise. This was, uh, oh God, we don't know what we're doing with IV fluids. Um, and in other words, it looked like we were killing kids by giving them IV fluid. So we don't like killing children, um, usually. That's not what we sort of do uh, on the whole. And so this raised a whole specter about looking at fluids and what was going on. And this was examined in great detail because it was, as it were, one area of a continent with a range of different conditions. 55% had malaria. Uh, over half of them had, were profoundly anemic, down to four grams per litre. Um, and the definitions of shock 
were very soft, for example, prolonged capillary refill time, as against the WHO criteria, which needed hypotension. So the recommendation got divided down into disease-specific areas because some of these underlying the problems that these diseases, their pathophysiology is different. As I mentioned to you about hypervolemic shock uh, from trauma is quite different to that from illness such as uh, meningococcal septicemia. So although there's capillary leak, the underlying processes are different. And therefore, we suggested using initial boluses in these specific conditions where there's associated capillary leak but against the routine use of IV fluids in children with fever but who are not in shock. The biggest point was this, which is about reassess. Do something, reassess. And that's true for all practicing clinicians. Really, really, really impo important. So just to focus on that, be careful about what you do with fluids and look at them again. That's a message for all clinicians. As I say, the feast, we took the feast on board, but thought that it would be difficult to generalize from one specific study to the whole. And this, we went to meet with the WHO, and they agreed the similar type of principle of practice, as it were, across all their WHO guidelines, too. We're now going to come towards the topic of the ends, which is non accidental injury. Shall we do this as a double act? Yes, why not? Go ahead. How much time have we got? We've got five minutes? Two minutes. Okay. okay. So the risk factors, we know that there are certain risk factors and this is where your help in the pre-hospital setting is so key. Things like, for example, getting a story about the history, the examination, what were the circumstances? Did this six-month-old really leap up the stairs and then slide down the banister? Those sort of things. Uh, what were the circumstances at the home that you found? Was the mechanism plausible? The sort of insights that you've had from interactions are so key to us in the emergency department. The delays in presentation, as you know, and the, if there's a fracture, particularly in a non-mobile child, that screams out at you. Mouth injuries and head injuries too. And of course, repeat attenders. Now, that depends if you're in a place where there's just one hospital. But in London, we have, unfortunately, too many, so people can go shopping to different places. Over to you. Yes, about. thank you. Uh, so the thing that we are um, really concerned about, because it leads to really long-term morbidity, and in many cases mortality, is what's called abusive head trauma or the shaken baby syndrome. And this is oftentimes a delayed diagnosis. You're called for a seizure, an apnea, a irritable or poorly responsive child, something very nonspecific. Um, and there's no real history to describe what happened other than perhaps an implausible story about a, you know, a two-year-old dropping the child or something along those lines. But what has happened, unfortunately, is that the, the baby's been exposed to a, a vigorous shaking. And that vigorous shaking does a couple of things. One is it results in the brain moving back and forth within the skull, and some of the veins that traverse that space between the brain and the skull get torn the so-called bridging veins, and that leads to blood in the subdural and subarachnoid spaces. It also can result in the infant experiencing uh, respiratory depression, uh, sort of like a, a, a massive concussion, and uh, not breathing adequately, and adding on top of that a hypoxic ischemic injury. And you've all heard of the classic sign in the upper left of the retinal hemorrhages, which are also just breaking, broken veins from the aggressive force. Sorry. So it's a diffuse brain injury that leads to tearing back of, the, of the veins and subdural, subdural and subarachnoid hematomas. It can be combined with an impact injury. The child may both be shaken and impacted against a hard surface, in which case there may be skull fractures. But retinal hemorrhages are the hallmark. Despite the fact that they may have vigorously moved the neck back and forth, actual spinal injury is uncommon. Uh, it should, like every other case in which we think there could be spinal injury from a mechanism, if you believe that there's been vigorous shaking, it's not unreasonable to immobilize the spine. But again, this usually turns up as the diagnosis a, a day or two later when things start coming together and the child, unfortunately, is experiencing seizures and, and other symptoms. 
Um, we, as Ian said, need people to be alert for this so that uh, if there is another child in the home who might be in danger, that child can at least be protected until this is sorted out. Yeah. So, just to summarize, these are the things that we've sort of covered in fairly brief manner, but things that are important in terms of the continuation of care from pre-hospital to ED through to uh, PICU. And the message is, again, I think logically, think safely, um, don't be too clever. A lot of the basic stuff we do is the absolutely important stuff, basic stuff. Think holistically, as we say, because there are often carers and parents attached and so on. It's really important to get a big picture about the home state. Always ask for help if you need it, and pre-warn. It's so nice to know what is needed beforehand. Um, and we've included in this uh, slide set, although you don't have it here, uh, all references that you may wish to use to go on for each one of the topic headings about practice, about current evidence and practice. And uh, this is going. the talk will be uploaded so you can look at this at your leisure. Thank you all so much for listening to both of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Ian, for sharing your great experience. Uh, we have time for two questions for the audience. Uh, there is some question, uh, extra question for the two speakers. I have a, okay. So one of the things about presenting is always leave just enough time for maybe one or two questions. <laughs> just a short question. How, uh, how common is it with the second uh, anaphylaxia shock when, when it comes, the first, first one comes, you treat it and you get an, a second one? Seizures? Are you, are you talking about for seizures? No, I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, anaphylaxis. Oh, I'm sorry. Anaphylaxis. Yeah, sorry. Repeating, yeah. repeating adrenaline yes. for anaphylaxis is what you're asking? Yeah, if you get a, a second uh, anaphylaxia. Okay. Yeah, so um, the uh, epinephrine has a very short half-life. Um, it's it's uh, quite a jolt when you do give it to someone. If you've ever given anybody a, an EpiPen or a shot, I mean, they will just shake and have a terrible headache, and it, it, it's quite extreme. But it goes away very quickly. It's probably metabolized within five or ten minutes. So if someone has recurrent symptoms of anaphylaxis, it may be that the allergen is still in their system and still causing the reaction beyond the time the epinephrine has lasted. And you certainly can retreat with another dose of epinephrine if 10 minutes has gone by and the child is uh, starting to get symptomatic again. That's the kind of patient who may wind up on a yeah. low-dose epinephrine infusion once they get to the hospital yeah. to just try to keep that reaction at bay until the allergen can get out of the system. I was saying in the UK it's now written down as practice six hours admission for anyone who's ingested uh, so you don't see this rebound because, as I say, the response is very fast. For everyone who's dealt with a child, the response is really fast. But again, it, it is still there if it's ingested. Okay, last question for me. Uh, yes or no? You are in the field. Uh, you have a, a baby. You, you are not sure if uh, epiglottitis, croup, seizure. It is appropriate to intubate as soon as possible or not? No. It's appropriate to intubate. Intubate. Intubate in the field. This oh. is a beautifully contentious area, as you know, because there are yeah. practitioners who do intubate, and it's a, it's a, it, there is there is a PICO question, sorry, a question, a local question that's being raised about this. Mm -hmm. There is certainly evidence in terms of experienced practitioners; they are able to intubate within the field, given the limitations of the circumstances there are. And if someone's dead, then you can't make someone more mm -hmm. dead than being dead because that's a fairly definitive outcome. But if they're not dead, then you've got options. And that's not always such a good thing. It might be a good thing for the patient, but you won't let them die as an option. That's not an option that you can take. Mm -hmm. You can try and intubate. It depends on your experience. It depends on how capable you feel and about how well you are able to do that and to monitor it and to sustain that period of intubation. So there's a bit of work from people who've read the literature by a guy called Gauche, G-A-U-C-H-E, I don't know if you've come across him, who looked at studies doing bag mask ventilation compared to more advanced airways, who found that there seemed to be lesser complication with adequate, good quality bag mask valve delivery by pre-hospital people. And that's certainly one of the ways in which 
taking all the other caveats into place, how long is the transport journey, what are the circumstances and so on, uh, for long, long transports with skilled people then it, and the right monitoring facilities, then intubation may be safer, mm -hmm. but intubation uh, also is difficult. So if it's not that big a journey, you may be better off doing bag mask ventilation with assistance. As I say, an NG tube is often helpful to decompress. That's my take on it. Yes, my answer is, is no also. Um, there, there are, intubation itself is, it can be very risky, particularly if it's in a child and uh, one doesn't have daily experience with, with children. Um, I, I work in a place where we certainly do um, a fair number of intubations, but it is always, always looked at as a high-risk event. And I, that's in the ICU with all the resources in the world you could want. Yeah. In the field, with limited resources, screaming parents, uncontrolled situation, uh, it certainly is risky. And so if you can manage the airway with a bag and mask, that's typically preferable. Um, LMA, I have mixed feelings about because they're very difficult to monitor during transfer. And uh, a misplaced LMA is as bad as a misplaced endotracheal tube. Um, so you want to do something where you can see there's chest rise, see there's air exchange, uh, and intubation is not the, the do-all, end-all until you're in a more controlled circumstance. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, thank Monica. You. And thank you to everybody. Please take a photo, put on Twitter, and please rate this session on uh, the app of EMS 2017. Thank you. Thank you to Michael Chairman. Have a good okay. day.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this last session on day one. My name is Lars Rasmussen. I am a professor of emergency medicine here in Copenhagen, Denmark. We are supposed to go through a couple of things this afternoon. First, uh, I would like to mention a few details about the app and the scavenger hunt. Uh, then we will summarize some of the sessions today with some take-home messages. And then Hans Morten Loschus will introduce our keynote speaker, and the topic is stroke. After his lecture, I will come back to the stage and mention some important aspects of the reception and also the emergency management event that takes place at the end of this day. Okay, so first about the app. Use it for creating your own agenda. Use it for getting in contact with the other delegates and the speakers. And also use it to rate the sessions. We really appreciate your feedback to improve this Congress as much as possible. But also, you should use it to participate in the scavenger hunt. And what is that? Well, you should go to the exhibition and collect points. And those with most points will participate, and hopefully there will be a great prize. I don't know what it is, but at least one winner will get an impressive prize. Uh, so please participate in this scavenger hunt. We have had a lot of interesting sessions today, and we have been looking through the various presentations, and it is my pleasure to summarize some of them. This session is about psychiatry. It was about psychiatry in the emergency medical system, and there were three key messages here. One is that psychiatrists should be involved in the system to improve quality in the handling of patients with psychiatric diseases. The second is that you need access to the patient records. And finally, you should be aware that this can Reduce, reduce the number of involuntary admissions for patients with psychiatric disease. So very important. For the session on research, our paramedic clearly recommended paramedics to participate in research, but you should spend a lot of time in finding the right supervisor for you as a paramedic. And she also emphasized that research can be lonely, so you should cooperate, and you should find a support network. And finally, of course, go for the highest quality of research. Finally, on the session dealing with trauma, you should measure outcome, because you can only improve what you measure. Measures are, however, time and context sensitive. And finally, each link in the chain matters. So with these words, I'd like to introduce Hans Morten Lusius. He is a Secretary General of the Norwegian Air Ambulance Foundation, and he will introduce our keynote speaker. So thank you. Dear audience, dear friends, stroke care has, for the last few decades, evolved from a lost case on focusing on palliative care to an emergency condition given the highest priority from EMS services. I remember from my period as a GP, I'm ashamed to say 30 years ago, for you that might be a long time, for me it's a short time. <laughs> when we had a stroke case on call on a Friday, we were not allowed to admit the patient to hospital until Monday because nothing was done with the patient during the weekend. So we had to keep the patient back home or in the local casualty clinic uh, for the weekend. Several groups are now working hard to increase our understanding of and ability to treat stroke. And this keynote lecture will focus on early diagnosis and treatment of stroke. So I will be hap I'm happy to introduce the keynote speaker, Professor Anthony Rudd. Professor Rudd is a consultant geriatrician and general physician at St. Thomas in London. He has developed a stroke service, which are rated among the best 
in the UK. He has an impressive list of scientific papers, ranging from more rehabilitation to the early phases of stroke, and also giving comments on recent developments in stroke treatment. He's engaged in system development, and he is demonstrating, as I see from his work and from his papers, that you need to do science, you need to do education, and you need to do implementation to save lives. You have to focus on the uh, formula of survival. And he has done that. So he has been uh, developing the stroke program, and he's been the stroke program director at the Royal College of Physicians since 1995. He has been the London Stroke Clinical Director since 2010. And he's the National Clinic Director of Stroke with NHS England since 2013. And from 2010, he has been a Professor of Stroke Medicine at King's College London. So, I'm very honored to introduce you, Professor Rod, and look forward to hearing your lecture. Okay. Thank you, Hans. Thank you very much indeed for that very kind uh, introduction. It's always really embarrassing to hear it. So I'm delighted that um, this conference has decided to focus on stroke um, because it is a condition which is devastating if it happens to you. And surveys of the public asking them which they would rather have, a heart attack or a stroke, always comes up that people would rather have a heart attack because of the consequences um, of uh, long-term disability after stroke. So a very eminent physician, um, about a little bit less than 100 years before I uh, was appointed as a consultant in London, wrote this about stroke, that it's the duty of the physician to explain to the patient and his friends that the condition is past relief and that medicines and electricity will do, do no good and there's no possible hope of cure. And that certainly um, was how the situation still was when I started as a consultant, and it sounds as though it wasn't very different in Norway either. So what I want to do is, uh, in this lecture is briefly run through a little bit about the burden of stroke, uh, talk about why I think stroke is a medical emergency, hopefully you don't need to be persuaded of that, a little bit about um, how we might perhaps try and improve the recognition of stroke by the public and by the emergency services, um, and then think about what we might be doing in the ambulance um, to the, on the way to the hospital. Why the organization of acute stroke care is important, and therefore why it might be important for the paramedics to drive that little bit further to get to the right place. And then finish off with a little bit about why um, it's important that paramedics also understand about transient ischemic attack um, and uh, start implementing treatment for that early. So this report, The Burden of Stroke in Europe, was published two weeks ago and presented to the European Parliament. And it summarizes some of the key data. There's over a million people every year in Europe who have a stroke. It's the third commonest cause of death. And it's predicted to rise in terms of the numbers of patients with stroke by about 35% over the next 20 years. That's not because we're getting worse at treating it, it's simply because the population is aging. In fact, the incidence of stroke has fallen by nearly 50% over the last 20 years. It's been a major success story, but because we're living older, longer, um, that is going to explain why we have so many more patients. Men, about a third of people who survive stroke will survive with sig very significant disability, but nobody who has a stroke is left completely unscarred. And it's a disease which is of huge financial implications to uh, nation states. It's been calculated that in England alone it costs seven billion pounds per year. So this slide, there's three messages from it. It shows the case fatality rate per 100 discharges um, with stroke in the European countries. And the first message is that um, hemorrhagic stroke is a far more dangerous condition than ischemic stroke. Those are the orange bars compared to the blue for the ischemic stroke. 
The second message is that there is very great variation between European countries in terms of their success at preventing death, a range between um, 5% or less than 5% uh, down to about 20% case fatality rate. And the third message is that if you're going to have your stroke or your heart attack, my advice to do it is in the next three days, because there cannot be any place in the world at the moment that has a higher concentration of people capable of doing CPR effectively. And if you look at this picture, Denmark is the country which has the lowest case fatality rate for stroke. So now is the time to do it. So these, this is picture shows the estimated number of strokes that there are now and, and where we're going to be in 20 years' time. Um, so clearly dependent upon the populations of the countries. But the message is, as I said a moment or two ago, that overall there is going to be a 35% increase uh, varying between countries in the numbers of stroke that we have to deal with. So it's important we get our services right now. The overall number of stroke survivors in the EU over the next 20 years is going to go up by about a million to four and a half. There's going to be a 45% increase in the number of stroke deaths, and there will be about a third increase in the number of people who are disabled um, as a result of stroke and living with disability. And it's not obviously just a European problem. Actually, the incidence of stroke is far higher in the low and middle income countries in the world, the red areas and the pink areas shown on this picture. And overall, every year there are 15 million people uh, who have a stroke across the world. So whenever you go to a meeting about stroke, you are always presented with a typical case history, and it's always a success story. So this was a 52-year-old woman we treated who developed a complete paralysis um, of her right side, uh, unable to speak as a result of dysphasia, and she developed a visual field defect on the right-hand side, previously fit and well. The friends called the paramedics. Um, she was working as a lawyer, no risk factors at all, apart from what I'm told is a very common habit amongst English lawyers, which is she took cocaine fairly regularly. And she arrived at the hospital an hour after the onset of symptoms, had a normal scan, um, and was concluded that she had a left-sided, left hemisphere ischemic damage, middle cerebral artery territory. She was treated with intravenous thrombolysis and got fantastically better home the next day. She was subsequently found to have atrial fibrillation. However, it's not always like that. And this is the 35-year-old man came in last year to my hospital, previously fit and independent, and been living um, in London for six months, uh, having come over from Poland, and he collapsed with a left side of weakness, brought to hospital also within an hour, very promptly, had the full range of treatment, but deteriorated rapidly, became unconscious, developed epilepsy, uh, never recovered, and died on day 14. And you can see from the pictures the huge right middle cerebral artery territory uh, area of ischemia there. So why is TI a stroke a medical emergency? Well, we're going to talk about intravenous thrombolysis. There's the um, expression time is brain that you'll all have heard about one point something billion nerve cells dying every minute or million I think dying every minute it's how they calculate it heaven only knows um, there's endovascular treatment we're going to talk about and I'm going to talk a little bit about intracerebral hemorrhage and the management of hypertension I'm not going to talk about the bottom two things on that list but they are crucially important and at a population level getting your patients to a specialist stroke unit where all the basic nursing and medicine can be done um, is more important than any of the WYSI uh, acute interventions which we are going to focus on. So intravenous thrombolysis for stroke applicable for about 20% of the population uh, of stroke admissions. Actually very, very few countries, if any, um, actually manage to achieve that level across the country, but there are individual units that do so it shows it can be done. It doesn't reduce mortality, and we'll come back to why in a minute, but it increases very significantly the likelihood of somebody surviving independent. It is a dangerous treatment. It's got to be given by people who know what they're doing in the right way and to the right patients. Um, and a thrombolysis service, as I say, is not the most important part of the service, but it is something which can transform individuals' lives. So in order to thrombolize effectively, you need to make a correct diagnosis, 
you have to have a good story and that paramedic picking up the patient first of all is in a really good position to get that story exactly when the symptoms first started. You've got to exclude hemorrhage because you'll kill the patient if you thrombolize somebody who has any element of bleeding and the only way of doing that is with brain scanning. You've got to exclude many of the other contraindications and you've got to explain to the patient what it is you're doing and you need to do all those things very quickly. The impact of uh, thrombolysis using uh, TPA on early outcomes within the first seven days is negative. Actually, if you look at the bottom of this uh, picture, you'll see that the thrombolysis increases the risk of death in the early stages, and that's because of an increased risk of bleeding as a result of the treatment. So a patient um, who I treated some years ago um, came in with a left middle cerebral artery territory infarct. Everything looked fine on the scan. We gave thrombolysis, and this was a subsequent follow-up scan shortly before the patient died. This patient may have done perfectly well if he hadn't been thrombolized, but there's no way that we have at the moment of predicting which patients are going to do well and which patients are going to do badly. However, so it's, it's potentially dangerous, but if you look out into the longer term, beyond the seven days and up to three months, six months and a year, then what you see is that the mortality rates even out because you're saving lives later on, and the chances of you surviving without disability are also greatly increased. So again, if you just focus on the diamond at the bottom in terms of a favorable outcome with a, a ranking score of zero or one, um, there's a about a 30% increased likelihood of people surviving with independence. And this emphasizes why it is so important that the emergency medical services operate quickly. If you get a patient to the drug, to thrombolysis, within 90 minutes, you only need to treat about four and a half patients to get one fantastic outcome, to transform somebody from profound long-term disability to being independent. That goes up to seven or eight, um, between um, 90 minutes and 180, and then up to about 14 um, if you go up to four and a half hours. And beyond that time, it's really not a very effective treatment. So time really is of the essence. So how do we get our patients treated more quickly? Well, only about a third of patients in the UK arrive at the hospital within the time suitable for thrombolysis to be given. That's because a third of them wake, have stroke during sleep, and if there was one thing I could do with stroke would be to make it a painful condition to wake them up, but they sleep through it, so we can't thrombolize then. And the other third um, delay because they don't recognize the symptoms, because they are male, and being male tends to make you put your head in the sand and ignore symptoms when they should do. And there's also confusion in the public mind about what a stroke is. They, they mix up heart attack and stroke. And there is still a belief in many parts of, the, uh, of Europe that um, if you go to hospital, there's not much point because they're not going to do anything very much. And for the paramedics, it's often a difficult situation because there's a lot of mimics that uh, can be mistaken and, and you know, we can all get things wrong. So I'm going to come back to the mimics in a minute. So one study was attempting to train uh, dispatchers to recognize stroke better. Uh, and this was done in the UK by Caroline Watkins and her team. 70% of patients with stroke in the UK, the first contact is with the ambulance services. Um, stroke, of course, only makes up a very small proportion of the calls that come in, only about 1%. Um, and previous studies have suggested that about 50% of the uh, decisions made by the dispatchers are wrong. They misclassify them. So the, uh, st the study, very simple, just to provide two hours of education to dispatchers in terms of what stroke is, what the symptoms might be, risk factors and mimics. And what they found was that before the training, actually slightly higher than the previous studies, were correctly identified 60% by the dispatchers. After training, that went up to 80%. There were marginal, not statistically significant, improvements in call to arrival times. But you can see that in that uh, graph on the right-hand side, it certainly looks as though they had an impact. Unfortunately, the study didn't continue long enough really to see if that impact was maintained longer term. But that certainly is something we should, I'm sure, be doing, is providing that 
extra education to the people taking the calls. We can try and improve the recognition of uh, symptoms by the first responders and within the public as well. And this is a, uh, an advertising campaign that we ran in the UK and have done on an annual basis for about the last uh, six or seven years based on the fa FAST, which is face, arm, speech, and time. Um, there are several other um, tools being used in the same way. Um, and uh, the question really is whether anything is better than fast because that is by clearly the simplest and most straightforward um, of the tests. There was one trial comparing FAST with the ROSIA, which is the recognition of stroke in the emergency room test. Very similar to FAST, but it's a bit more complicated. You've got to take a history about whether there's been any seizure activity, loss of consciousness, and, and check for visual field defect. Um, and what that showed um, in comparing those, uh, that trial, they ran it in London. Um, they assessed 312 patients um, with the ROSIA. And the paramedics who were doing the assessment identified 284 out of the 312 patients as having a stroke or TIA. And when it came to the consultant diagnosis, out of those 284, 171 were confirmed and 97 weren't. Um, and um, in the non-stroke group um, of the 28, there were actually eight strokes. And compared to the FAST test that was done simultaneously, actually there was very little difference. It showed no additional benefit for that extra time that was taken and probably resulted in delays in the patients getting to the hospital. So there's this paper by Brandler published three years ago um, in neurology looking at the difference in the sensitivity and the specificity of the seven main different stroke scales and actually, again, not really very much difference. The Los Angeles pre-hospital stroke scale perhaps came out slightly better in terms of its sensitivity. But um, overall, my personal view is that the simplest thing to do is to do the fast, except that it will um, not always pick everyone up, that there will be some inappropriate diagnoses, but it's quicker, and if there's any doubt, even if you're fast negative, you should still take the patient quickly to the hospital if you have a suspicion of it. 40% of patients with a diagnosis uh, at the scene of thought to be stroke uh, actually turn out to have mimics. And these are the list of the various diagnoses that uh, most commonly present as initially thought to be stroke but turn out not to be. So there's Bell's palsy, which I'm sure you can all perfectly well recognize. If the patient can't close their eye properly when they screw their face up, then it's probably a, a, a Bell's palsy if there are no other focal neurological symptoms. There's hypoglycemia, and of course, you're all going to be checking the blood sugar as one of the first things you do, but the other metabolic conditions can present with focal neurology, as can Todd's paresis, so that's paralysis after uh, an epileptic seizure. Migraine, one of the more common things that I see both in the A&E department and in my clinics for TIA clinics, peripheral nerve, nerve injuries. And in London, it maybe it's, uh, we've got a particular population. There's an awful lot of people who have non-organic um, stroke symptoms. But there are also quite a large number of patients who present who are missed. And there is no way that any screening tool, I think, would pick up all of the patients because stroke can present in such a myriad of different ways. So posterior circulation, very frequently missed. People come developing a bit of unsteadiness, maybe some visual disturbance, uh, thought to be drunk very often. The isolated visual abnormalities without anything else. The patients who present simply with problems with language, unable to express themselves, um, or slurring of speech, um, often labeled as being confused uh, and taken to the geriatric ward. And then people who have um, maybe pre-existing disability, maybe from previous stroke, who then deteriorate and it's assumed that it's simply a chest infection or a urine infection on top of their previous stroke rather than recognizing this as a new ischemic episode. So is there a potential to make ambulance services more efficient and effective? Well, these are data taken from the recent uh, report from the London Ambulance Service. This slide shows their performance on the care bundle, which is that every patient they pick up needs to have a fast score recorded, blood pressure and blood sugar recorded, and they do extremely well, nearly uniformly high performance. 
This is the data looking at their, the timings of the, uh, of the uh, ambulance service. So the blue at the bottom is the 999 to, to arrival, and they do pretty well. The yellow bar bits of the bars are the time on the scene, and then the dark blue are the, is the journey time. And I think if you look at that, you would have to question um, whether or not if there was a possibility of speeding things up, that you took some time off the time at the scene. Um, and uh, it's not an area I'm experienced in. I know there's lots of things that the uh, paramedics need to do when they're on scene, but uh, that would be where I would begin to start doing some more detailed analysis to see if it was possible to scoop people up a little bit more quickly. One way of saving time might be to use mobile stroke units. Shortening door to needle time is the question whether it can achieve that. The systems vary, uh, but usually in the back of the van you've got a doctor, a paramedic, a technician, sometimes linked by telemedicine to the radiologist or to the stroke specialist at the center to provide advice or to do the reports. And if you go outside the front door here, you'll see this Norwegian mobile stroke unit parked outside. There has been one study, or there have been a few studies, but this is the one I'm going to focus on. This is one of the early ones from 2012 uh, from Germany, which was published in Lancet Neurology, looking at the trial that they did there um, using the mobile stroke unit versus hospital care. So they had 361 patients that they screened. They excluded two-thirds of those and were left with about 100 patients uh, who entered the randomization stage. Patients were excluded for all sorts of reasons to do with age and symptoms and so on. So of the 100, 53 had the mobile stroke unit pathway and 47 were assigned to the normal pathway of being picked up and taken to the local hospital. And the results were that the distance was not significantly different between the hospitals. It was a slightly old randomization process that I'm not going to go into. But the Time to um, therapy, so from the alarm, the time the call was made to therapy, was significantly lower in the group that were treated in the back of the ambulance. And there was very little, there was no statistical significant difference actually in terms of the numbers of patients who eventually received thrombolysis and no difference in the outcomes, but then it was a very small trial. I think there are potential issues with the study, I'm, I, and I remain a little bit of a skeptic about uh, mobile stroke units. The door to needle time in the hospitalized patients was quite long. In London, we managed to do it within sort of 30 minutes to 45 minutes maximum. They were a bit longer than that. So maybe a potential to have improved the hospital side of the service. There was very little detail about the resources required. If you take an average district of about a quarter of a million people, um, treating 400 strokes a year, of which perhaps 80 are thrombolizable, the ambulance team is going to be treating one or two patients every week. That's a very low activity ambulance. And if you extend it to a population of a million, it's still only one person per day. And the costs of the ambulance, probably somewhere between half a million and a million dollars, US dollars, and the cost of running the team estimated at about a million dollars per year. So it's a very expensive uh, service to provide. And I do think you need to come back and look to see if there are other alternative ways of delivering rapid door to needle times. In Slovakia, I was in Prague um, last week at the European Stroke Conference, they showed a video of uh, a system that they had developed where the door to needle time was about 10 minutes, with the paramedics taking the patient directly into the scanner, putting the patient onto the scanner machine, having of course pre-warned the team who were there ready, assessing the patients and giving the drug. If you can achieve that, then maybe you don't need your scanner in the back of an ambulance. However, there are new things coming up. If you can do CT angiography in the back of the van and then direct your patient to the thrombectomy center, which I'll come back to, that might be useful, and that's already being done in Berlin. If you expand the role of these mobile stroke units to have more input into other neurological emergencies, that then may, might make it a viable option, so dealing with the head injuries and the epilepsies. Maybe useful, needs to be tested in rural areas. And maybe if you go for a much more simplified system, just with um, really good telemedicine in the back of the ambulance, um, linked into the specialist, then you could perhaps do more with less money. 
It's also important, not just intravenous thrombolysis now, but also to get a man into people's arteries uh, and help clear the clot. So there's a, an interventional neuroradiologist um, looking down the tube. A typical case history, this is a patient, and I'm grateful to colleagues at Imperial Hospital um, in London for this. So this is a 46-year-old woman uh, who was at work cleaning um, at 11 o'clock in the morning, suddenly developed a left, sudden onset of left-sided weakness. She was very reluctant to have the ambulance called and, and sat around for an hour and a half or more. Uh, eventually, the uh, ambulance arrived, uh, getting on for nearly two hours after the onset of the stroke. Very quick on scene, straight to Northwick Park Hospital, where she had this scan done. I haven't got a pointer, but if you look on the left-hand side, of the uh, picture, you can see a little white line, which is the thrombus in the right middle cerebral artery. She had left-sided weakness, dysarthria, had a NIHSS score, which is a measure of the severity of the stroke of 16, indicating this was quite a large scope of the stroke. Uh, she had a CT scan. Decision was made to consider thrombectomy. She was bridged with intravenous thrombolysis uh, and sent to the thrombectomy center at Charing Cross. By then, she was already a little bit improved, but still had significant symptoms. She was taken very quickly to the angio suite, and the thrombus was removed. You can see the angiogram prior to the uh, um, thrombectomy on the left-hand side, and then the reperfusion, the blood vessels filling again on the right-hand side. And there's the little bit of clot that's been doing all that damage and potentially leading to somebody with a profound disability. So she was, did very well and went home a couple of days later, a very small infarct indicated by the arrow, but this is what could have happened and this is what we commonly see, that dark area <coughs> being dead brain and there's no recovery from that essentially. So thrombectomy now has, is supported by a very strong evidence base. There have been about seven or eight different trials done in different ways, with particularly regarding different sorts of imaging. Uh, but the meta-analysis, if you just focus on the top two bars, and this is the overall outcomes, look, putting all those trial data together, your chances of having a good outcome, so little or no disability whatsoever, um, almost double. The number needed to treat ranges between two and seven. There are very few interventions in medicine which are as powerful as that. Um, and so this is clearly something which we need to develop. It is likely in most countries that you're not going to be able to staff thrombectomy units in every single hospital treating acute stroke. And certainly in the UK, we have about 100, 120 hyperacute stroke centers, comprehensive stroke centers, but we think we can only afford to run and to staff um, about 30 or 35 maybe. So there is going to be a situation where in, when we get everything set up, the paramedics are going to arrive on scene and they're going to be taking a patient to the comprehensive unit. They're then going to be told, hang on, wait, we've got to do an angiogram, and you now need to transfer the patient somewhere else. The question is, is there any way that you, as the first people on the scene or the emergency medical services, um, can identify those patients and take them to the right place first time? Unfortunately, at the moment, the answer is no. Um, there are, um, there are no reliable methods that enable you to filter those patients out with sufficient reliability not to completely flood the thrombectomy center with very large numbers of untreatable, really severe stroke patients. But that work is ongoing. The next thing that you might need to get involved with in the future is managing blood pressure in people with hemorrhage. Um, and this is a uh, picture showing a sequential scans in a patient whose deter neurology was deteriorating uh, within the first six hours after their stroke. And about 30% of uh, hemorrhages um, expand within the first six hours. And we know from a couple of trials now, but particularly this one, the Interact 2 study, um, that bringing the blood pressure down uh, to about 140 millimeters of mercury probably reduces the likelihood of that hemorrhage increasing. So these are the primary outcomes from that um, study. So slightly lower major disability, no difference in death, um, just crosses the line of uh, equi equity at 1.01. .01. Um, 
but uh, the b belief amongst uh, the stroke population or stroke physicians is that this is uh, something which we should be attempting to do. It's been further evidence from a subsequent trial. So the question is whether or not you could actually introduce blood pressure lowering in the ambulance as you travel to the hospital. Um, and that is something, there is a big trial going on at the moment in Europe, uh, based in the UK, about putting GTN patches onto the patients, um, and that should report within the next 18 months. So, organization of care. It really is critical to get the organization of stroke services right. There is absolutely no point taking your patients um, to, as quickly as you can, to the wrong place, to a service which is not set up and not competent to deal with patients. And that was certainly the case in London back in 2010, or before 2010. Uh, each of these bars represents one hospital um, and their performance on the national stroke audit. And all the red bars are basically inadequate performance, some of them pretty diabolical. And we made a decision that we would reconfigure stroke care in London. Um, pre uh, the, to begin with, we had very good hospitals in the center of London and not very good hospitals around the outside. And that's, of course, exactly the opposite of where the patients were. Very few old people live in the center of London. So we had fantastic services for, for virtually no patients and crap services for the ones on the outside. So we made a decision that we, something needed to be done. We had widespread support from clinicians for change, strong evidence to show what a service should look like and a health service at that time, no longer unfortunately, uh, that was capable of implementing major system change um, if they decided it was the right thing to do. There's some evidence to support it, so we had data to show that larger units perform better than smaller units. We had data to show that the number of nurses you have will reduce your mortality if you higher numbers of nurses produce better results. We had evidence to show that actually there was big variability, and that still remains in the UK as a whole, but across the week. So this is a slightly complex slide, but basically these, each one of these dots represents a four-hour period during the course of the week. So seven days, um, four-hour period, so 42 dots for each one. Red is poor performance, blue is good. So the thrombolysis rate um, varies quite a bit uh, between the, the hours of the day, okay? So you're much less likely to be thrombolized at night time if you arrive than during the day, and this is adjusting for various things. And your door to needle times are also gonna be worse at night, but also worse at weekends. So we need to get rid of some of these inequalities, have units which are capable of delivering really high quality care every single minute of every single day. And we came up with a model of eight hyperacute units, um, treating these patients within the first 72 hours and then repatriating to their local hospitals. Overnight, the thrombolysis rates went up dramatically and have stayed up. The survival from stroke in London is significantly better by about 20% compared to the rest of the country. And the, what those, that, this reconfiguration has taught us is that that hub and spoke model can operate effectively in a large urban area, but it needed the enthusiastic support of the whole system, including the emergency medical services. Um, and we also learned that patients will accept going to a hospital that is some distance away. They don't complain. Just very briefly, towards the end now, I think that paramedics have a really important role to play in the management of TIA. So strokes that completely resolve within one hour, the vast majority of these are ischemic, and there is a very high risk of patients who present with TIA going on and having a completed stroke. And the likelihood of that completed stroke happening is within the first day or two. So urgent treatment really is essential. And in some patients, it's up to a 30% risk within the first month of going on and having a completed stroke. We know what the acute treatment should be. So it's an immediate antiplatelet drug, an immediate statin, uh, control the blood pressure, vascular risk reduction. You shouldn't be driving for a month afterwards, at least in the UK, you're not allowed to. And the warning that if anything was to happen, you dial for the emergency medical services straight away and you don't put your head in the sand. 
There is good evidence, this is a paper from uh, Peter Rothwell in The Lancet, of the impact of just getting an aspirin into people. These, this is data from meta-analysis of all the aspirin trials. Very powerful uh, reduction in terms of the risk of stroke within the first, if you look just at the first two bars within the first six weeks. And he also did this study looking at a before and after. Before was a fairly normal TIA service, seeing people within a day or two, giving them a prescription to go off and get the tablets, and the phase two was uh, getting them in within the 24 hours, watching them swallow the tablets. And what he did was to demonstrate that he managed to reduce the risk of recurrence from about 10% over the first three months down to about 2%, a five-fold reduction in the risk of people going on to have further TIA or stroke. So what about the role of paramedics? Well, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be that the paramedic is actually in a really good position to be able to make that judgment, the assessment, make the diagnosis. If there are still symptoms when you arrive, that is still a stroke and the patient needs to go straight to the hospital. But if it's not, if they fully recovered, in my view, it's a complete waste of time and effort to take them to the hospital. If you can get the paramedic to give the, the statin and the aspirin, particularly the aspirin, watch them take it. If the paramedic can make very swift arrangements, go straight into the booking system to get them seen within 24 hours at the hospital and so on. So what standards should we be using to measure the performance of the EMS? First thing is, I don't think travel times are particularly relevant or even response times are particularly relevant. What's relevant is the time from the call to the time the patient is treated. And I would much rather we measure that. That way we will encourage the reconfiguration of services to have much more efficient, to, to take people to the right place first time. Clearly completing the stroke bundle consistently. Um, accuracy of recognition of sim stroke symptoms by dispatchers needs to be monitored. Um, and, but we mustn't forget that we're putting all this burden onto emergency services. We reconfigure stroke services and tend to forget that that often leads to an increased need uh, for paramedics and for ambulances. So where have we come from? Stroke is now quite clearly a treatable disease. Mortality has fallen dramatically by about half um, over the last uh, 20 years or so. People used to say why, the paramedics used to say when they came to the hospital, I don't know why I bothered rushing. I got to the uh, emergency department and then was kept waiting in a queue and the ward and the sister in the emergency department said, I don't know why you rushed. Um, and also a belief that stroke didn't need specialists. So where should we be in the future? Paramedics delivering initial treatment, blood pressure lowering, triaging patients with TIA to urgent outpatient pathways, possibly, although I remain to be convinced, increasing use of mobile stroke units, identifying ways of, uh, of, of systems for people to be identified as having large vessel occlusion so we can get them straight to the thrombectomy centers. But as, we, as I talk here now, the most important therapy that you offer, to be honest, is the diesel in your van. Um, and using it quickly. So, stroke is treatable. Paramedics are critical uh, for enabling those insurgency measures to be treat treatments to be given. We need better public education. We need to organize stroke care better so that people always get to the right place at the right time. We should be measuring our performance and we need to provide paramedics with the skills to manage TIA more effectively. So, as was said this morning, it takes a system to save a life. Actually, it's many lives you can save, and it also prevents disability. Thank you. Thank you so much for a very, very interesting lecture. And you're open for questions, I yes, guess? Of course, yeah. yeah. Any questions from the audience? Use the opportunity now to ask the ask expert. Paul Kongstad. Yeah. yeah. Paul Kongstad, Sweden. Uh, thank you very, very much for an all round and very interesting lecture. I have one question, and it's from the neurologist in our region. And uh, they are a bit uh, discussing. Uh, that uh, if you take the patients directly to CT, you will have very many other diagnoses as well with you. And some of the neurologists, they want to have the patient 
uh, in the emergency room first and then to the CT. So we have on one university hospital that way of treating the patient and on the other we have directly to CT. Well, on, when we take the patient directly to the CT, we could have a door to needle time under 10, 10 minutes, which I think is really, really, really good. And that's also with help from the ambulance crew. So what's your opinion about this? Because I think this is, uh, uh, is some sort of, of uh, uh, choice we have to do. Are we relying on the pre-hospital personnel in their judgment of is this a, a case for thrombolysis or for uh, a thrombectomy? Or should we go the ordinary way, the traditional way with uh, emergency physician that will uh, investigate the patient first? I think the ideal solution is that the ambulance does drive straight up to the CT scanner if that's possible, but there's a neurologist there ready to assess. The neurologist is going to have to be there to make the decision about thrombolysis once the scan's done, two or three minutes later, much better if they are there to do a quick assessment. And certainly there are a large number, your neurologists are right, there are a large number of people who you can avoid doing a CT scan on. Um, by a quick assessment, but it takes no more than a minute or two to do a quick evaluation to determine does this patient need an urgent CT scan now or not. So that's how the Slovakians do it, that's how some centres in the UK try and do it. I think just taking everybody straight into the scanner and scanning everybody without further screening probably is not the right thing to do. So, right understood, if we exclude the children, we could take the adult patients to directly to the CT. Yep. So, I, I tell my not neurologist at home that, that this has been said here. Thank, Thank you very you. much. More questions? Over there. We used to use uh, calcium channel blockers to lower blood pressure, and I was wondering why I remember being contraindicated for lowering blood pressure if we saw signs and symptoms of stroke. Do you know why that is? Sorry, I missed the second part of the question. The first was about calcium channel blockers, but I used those. The second is? For, yeah, for lowering blood pressure, but this, um, they were contraindicating it for using calcium channel blockers for lowering blood pressure if you had signs and symptoms of stroke and why that is. Okay. I don't think there is great evidence to show there's major problems. There was some concern um, about the risk of, of causing intracranial arterial spasm with, with uh, calcium channel blockers. Um, but I think that's, been, that's fairly theoretical. Most places either use GTN either intravenously or as a patch or lobetalol shots um, as the way of bringing a blood pressure down quickly, either in the context of intracerebral hemorrhage or if you need to bring the blood pressure down in order to administer uh, TPA. You need to have uh, a blood pressure at least below 180 millimeters systolic for, to be giving thrombolysis. So, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, James Ward. Uh, hi, thank you um, for a completely illuminating uh, presentation. <laughs> um, if, I, if I heard you correctly, the reorganization of the services in London into the specialist units it resulted in an improvement of survival of 20%. Could you just talk a bit more about what was behind that, what actually brought about that improvement? There's been very extensive work actually been looking at, at the whole process in terms of delivering the change and the impact of the change. Um, and it seems to be um, probably about getting people simply to the stroke unit, to an expert stroke unit um, on time. There's a lot of stuff around, you know, were various processes given? Um, to patients, did they get hydration, did they get uh, oxygen when appropriate and so on, all of which were much better in the patients treated um, in the hyperacute unit compared to the previous system. So it's about doing the simple things well which probably resulted in the reduction in mortality 
um, because the increased thrombolysis rate, you wouldn't expect that to have that mortality increase. And particularly, it was a very, very similar reconfiguration process went on in Manchester at the same time as London, but they, their system was slightly different. In Manchester, they made a decision that they would simply take people with, to the comprehensive stroke center if they were potentially thrombolizable within four and a half hours of onset of symptoms um, and uh, you know, lots, of, lots of other comorbidities. Um, whereas in London, we made a decision that every single patient should be taken to the comprehensive center. And it's actually the older, the frailer, the patients with more comorbidities who have most to gain from getting expert care right at the beginning. And I think that's what led to the difference. Yes, time is flying, so we have to move on. But I have one last comment for, for you. Uh, uh, you said that time from symptom onset till treatment to trombolysis is the important thing that we should focus on. Uh, so we can agree on that. On that. So then I will use the opportunity to invite you. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock, we will have some FNQs at uh, this mobile stroke unit outside here. Maybe we could relieve some of your worries about uh, the mobile stroke units. You're welcome to come there. And all of you are as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, finally, a few words about this afternoon. Don't miss the welcome reception. You can still register for that event. The reception will take place on board some boats that will pick you up. So follow the volunteers carrying blue balloons. Bring your batch with you. And we'll have the reception in the boats. They will bring you to the emergency management event. OK? So don't miss that event. Please remember to participate in the world record for life. Outside, you have time to do that. And finally, don't miss the morning run. We will meet at Copenhagen City Hall Square at 6.25. Thank you for, for participating today.